pleasure to be here. And as some of the previous speakers, my connection to Profano was not very weak. I had no chance to scientific interaction with him. But uh, during the time I did my PhD thesis at the University of Freiburg in atomic collision physics, he was several times at Freiburg, and so I heard some talks. I even talked to him sometimes, and uh, well, that's my connection to Gofano. But I <coughs> hope I can show you something in my talk which <coughs> will be of interest for you. Sorry, what? It seems to be off. Did it get switched off? Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Is that all right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what I plan to do today is to talk about adaptive femtosecond quantum control. And in my talk today, I would <coughs> like to address specifically the question of laser control of chemical reaction dynamics. With femtosecond lasers, we nowadays can not only resolve the motion of the atoms during a chemical reaction, but we can also, also now uh, selectively control that motion and induce the pre-selected bond breaking at a microscopic level uh, with tailored femtosec laser pulses. However, the question is, <coughs> uh, and the problem is, how do we find out which laser pulses are best suited to solve a given problem? And if we have solved that problem, we, of course, have to ask, how do we generate exactly that laser pulse we need at the interaction of the light with the particular molecular systems? So what I will do, I will cover two <coughs> things. First, I will talk something about adaptive femtosecond pulse shaping. How do we produce these optical electric fields we need? And then I will show you an example in gas phase control, liquid phase control. And probably time is running out. I don't come to the uh, problem of the inversion of the up the electric field. Well, of course, I would like to give credit to my co-workers here, essentially, <coughs> Thomas Baumer, who was involved in the gas phase control, and uh, Tobias Brixner, who essentially led the, the group in liquid phase control. And of course, the different agents, agencies which have contributed to finance and to get all the money uh, for doing the research. Let me. Uh, make uh, two remarks at the beginning. Of course, I know that uh, all of you know that uh, <clears throat> an ultra-short laser pulse has to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle a broad spectral distribution. That means whenever a femtosecond laser pulse interacts with atoms, molecules, surface, solid states, liquid phase, molecule systems, we create a sta uh, so coherent superposition of levels. We form a wave packet. And the propagation of wave packet, of the wave packet in time, will enable us by shaping that wave packet during the interaction time to direct a certain wave packet into a certain direction on a multidimensional potential energy surface. And the second remark is because we have a broad spectral distribution, the laser pulse undergoes dispersion. But as we will see later in the talk, we make use of these dispersion in order to drive the system and to form and to shape the particular laser fields in the way we need. Well, I guess you all know that the chemical reaction can be described as an atomic motion on potential energy surfaces. Here, we form a wave packet, and then this wave packet may propagate into this direction, breaking essentially the bond between B and C, or it can propagate in that direction where the bond between A and B is broken. The probability of going this direction, that direction, depends, of course, on initial conditions, on a particular potential energy surface in the excited manifold, and, of course, on the shape of the wave packet. And that's what we are trying to control in these experiments. In order to influence and to enhance the efficiency of the direction, either in this direction or that direction, uh, chemically, uh, chemistry, traditionally, macroscopic means like temperature, like pressure, like concentration, have been used, in a, and also in a microscopic level, catalysis, 
that drive things in this or in that direction. And you probably know that since the laser has been invented for more than 40 years, there were many attempts to control the chemical reaction dynamics with lasers, but they essentially all failed. Mainly because, <coughs> uh, the f because of the fast dissipation of energy due intramolecular vibrational energy redistribution. When the first lasers were <coughs> uh, built, they were uh, considered to be the ideal tool for microscopic control of these chemical reaction dynamics because for the selective cleavage of molecular level, uh, bonds. The original idea was that take a laser, tune the laser to exactly the bond energy, and put enough energy into that bond, deposit enough energy so that the vibrational periods get bigger and bigger and bigger, and by that you would break this particular selected bond. As I said, this selectivity is lost because of the intermolecular energy redistribution, which is very fast. So this essentially did work. Imagine we have a complex molecule. This should be a complex molecule here, e even though it's only a tribe. We will say later on some complex molecules. We can ask ourselves, what does the electric field of a laser has to look like in order to achieve selectivity, in order to drive the system into this reaction channel or in this reaction channel, or maybe even preferentially into that versus that one if we don't have 100% uh, uh, selectivity. Of course, to determine these electric field needs, we need to uh, know the potential energy surface, as I've already shown you. Even modern chemistry, for complex system, it's not possible to calculate these potential surfaces well enough in order to calculate the optimized electric fields which we would need to drive the system into this direction. So, uh, this is a difficulty f uh, which we uh, have. But let's assume we would solve that problem that we would really could calculate exactly this necessary electric field. Then we would have a second problem. How do we create an electric field that it looks exactly that at the interaction place with the molecular system on a microscopic level? If a femtosec laser pass, an ultra short laser pass, propagates through material or even through air, it gets broadened because of dispersion. The dispersion will prevent us from having a laser pass like that. So the exact laboratory realization of predictive fields are difficult. So in that situation, it looks like <coughs> that uh, we are stuck, of course. Femtosecond lasers might be the ideal tool <laughs> to drive these systems because during the interaction time of a femtosecond laser, there is practically no nuclear configuration change, no <coughs> variation. The molecular system is essentially frozen out. But still, we encounter the problem that we need to know this exact electric field, and we have to <coughs> create the prep to repair this electric field. Well, in this situation, <coughs> they have been uh, proposed that one makes use of the coherent nature of the laser radiation. And all these different <coughs> proposals uh, are known under the name of coherent control, which acts as a broad range of quantum interference uh, effects. It started with the <coughs> Brumer Shapiro phase control there. They <coughs> demonstrated in atoms and dynamics molecules, theoretically, of course, that they, through the interaction of the field of 3 omega with the field of omega, due to the difference of phase, of phase control, you can run through constructive or destructive interference, and by that you can, can up, came, come up with a selectivity in the final state. This is a one parameter control, this is a phase control. Another one parameter control was a tenor cuts of rice control, a so-called pump dump. You start with a laser, create a wave packet, and this wave packet propagates on its uh, potential entry surface until a nuclear configuration is found where essentially, if you dump then this wave pack <coughs> down to a lower potential energy surface, you will, uh, uh, the wave pack propagates in this direction, so it's bought between B and C is broken, or if you wait a little bit longer, it access a different part of the potential surface, so this bond is broken. This, again, a one pr uh, uh, parameter control scheme, and also the steer up control of Berkman, where you use two different laser fields that transfer in a counter to way the all 100% population for one into three. 
But these are all one parameter con uh, control schemes. And <clears throat> we still have the problem, of course, <clears throat> in this situation uh, to find out what is electric, the exact electric field, because here, of course, for an atom or diatomic molecule, you know the essential potential energy surface well enough, but not for complex systems, as we will see in a minute. Now, but let's, let me just uh, refer to the tenor cost of rise scheme to make clear what I mean. We can control uh, the atomic motion within a chemical direction and that we can influence the outcome by the interaction with the laser of a system. Here, I just choose a simple diatomic molecule with a ground electronic state. With a UV laser, we form a coherent supposition of vibration rotation levels. We form a vibrational wave pack which propagates back and forth. If we design the experiment is such that we now take a, another probe laser, a different wave, we transfer the information, we transfer this wave packet into the fragmentation continuum. So we have a, a, a sodium ion, a, a neutron, and an electron. If we measure these atomic ions as a function of delay time between the blue laser and the red laser, we see this wave packet dynamics. We see the motion of the atoms in a, a molecular system as you will see here, the maximum signal, the outer turning point, inner turning point, outer turning point, etc., etc. That's what, what we mean when we say we can control atomic motion in real time during a chemical reaction. But this immediately, therefore, I've chosen that one, shows you what I mean that we can, by using, for instance, one parameter control of tenor cost of rise, we can direct systems in a particular channel. Here, at this interaction time between delta T, between a blue and a green laser, here we break the bond. However, if the green laser is applied at exactly the same time as the blue laser forms the wave packet, we photoionize the molecule, we keep the bond. So at the time difference between the blue and the green laser, here we go from an area where we uh, keep the bond, here we break the bond. This is essentially what, of course, a laser does when the wave packet propagates at different times to access different <coughs> potential parts of potential energy surface, and by that you can break then different bonds <coughs> at a, a particular time. But still, uh, these type of control schemes are based on a limited number of optimization parameters. In more complex systems, <coughs> they may not be sufficient. In this situation, Rabitz came up with the idea uh, to use <coughs> optimal control theory to design the electric field which is needed for such a particular chemical reaction or drive it in one particular reaction channel. And however, it was, was 1988, it was it soon realized that uh, still you would need, by applying optimal control theory, the exact Hamiltonian. Then, uh, two years later or three years later, he suggested that one should use optimal control theory and uh, one should maximize the efficiency of the reaction product efficiency by directly including the experimental output in a learning algorithm in the optimization. So let's assume we have a laser and electric field. It interacts with our system, a molecule, a solid, or liquid phase, or whatever. We measure the product ratio or the efficiency or whatever comes out of the interaction of the laser with the material system. Take the result together with the, our objective into a learning algorithm. And this learning algorithm produces and suggests a modified electric field, which we produce, of course, or have to produce. Let it interact with the control system. We get a higher efficiency, a better product ratio, etc., etc. Go again into the learning algorithm and go many times through this iterative loop and we'll finally end up with a global optimal electric field which solves the problem under the given experimental circumstances, gives us the highest product field, uh, yield or the highest efficiency or whatever we were looking for. Of course, it is essential in that respect, I'll come back to that in a minute, that we need to ask the right questions, that we, the objective is clearly defined for such an experiment. Well, the <coughs> implementation of hertz rabitz suggestion is shown here. In our experiment, <coughs> we make use of a computer-controlled a pulse shaper, and I will say a word to that in a minute. So we come in with an unshaped laser pulse, the laser pulse is shaped. Maybe we have a, laser, a shaped laser pulse like that. It may even interact, let's say, with a nonlinear crystal, produce a second time generation, then as optical feedback, or if you have a complex molecule in a gas phase, 
and you let it interact with that, and you fragment the system at the time of light mass spectrometer, you get uh, the uh, yield of this particular species or that particular, take that as a feedback, or in a liquid phase, you can use either uh, emission or you can four wave mixing <coughs> or a transient uh, absorption, a different means to get the information out of liquid phase, all the feedback into that computer. Here we use a <coughs> combination of genetic algorithms and evolution strategies in order to uh, have a learning means by which we can then improve the electric field by using this liquid crystal pulse shaper. As you will see, here we use a grating, disperse the whole spectral distribution of the outer shot laser pulse on these liquid crystal models. We impose a phase, I will come back in a minute to that, we reform the laser pulse again and then we can form with this device, any arbitrary laser pass we really need for our particular uh, problem or for different problems. The pulse shaper we used is based on the Weiner heritage design. And I will show you here a rather colorful transparency, but which makes clear what we really <coughs> uh, do. This is the input laser pulse which comes in. It's a broad spectral distribution. And this is our liquid crystal modulator in most cases, we use 128 pixels or even 256 pixels. That means the spectrum of an ultra-sharp laser pulse is separated in the 128 different spectral components. If we apply a voltage to these liquid crystals, liquid crystals are banned. That means we change <coughs> the optical pathway, we change index of refraction. That means we change the phase of that particular spectral component. Of all these spectral components, which are shown over here, the blue one, the yellow, the red ones, and if we then form <coughs> from the frequency space and the time space, again, the tail of frequency laser pulses, the yellow frequency occur at the beginning, then the green, the blue, and the red frequencies. Here you see the beauty of that. This is controlled by the voltages which are set by the computer. Let's assume we have a, a particular problem. We form a broad wave packet. This wave packet propagates a potential surface. So the molecule acts as, as an analog computer, solves its own Schrodinger equation. It tells us at what times it needs what frequencies. And by adjusting the voltages on these liquid crystals, we can then remove, we can change the frequencies, we can change the amplitudes and also polarization stage, as I'll show you in a minute, to perform a Taylor femtosecond laser pulse. So it's always the broad distribution, the broad wave pack, the total wave pack, despite that was said, on Wednesday, we always need the broad, the fully wave packet and change the wave packet, the shape, and the different content of the frequencies in order to drive the system into a particular action channel. And of course, after having then, at the end, the optimized electric field, the optimized laser pulse, we might get some information then <coughs> uh, about the physics and the chemistry, what's really going on. Well, just for the sake of... <coughs> Clarity, one thing, uh, because uh, the language is uh, uh, certainly not so common to everybody here. A laser pulse, one laser pulse with electric field is our individuum. And the voltages on these 128 pixels are the genes of that particular individuum. These are the different voltages. After applying a laser pulse to our problem, we get an experimental result which we evaluate with our fitness goal. We determine the fitness of this particular electric field laser pulse. We usually start with a, a number of 60 different laser pulses per generation. We take the 10 out of the pool of individuals. We take the 10 best laser pulses, which we are transferred into the next generation. The 10 best laser pulses undergo mutation and undergo crossovers. By that, we form the rest of the 10 here, 40 laser pulse so that we have a new pool of individuals. Since we clone the 10 best ones, we always have in the next generation at least the same ratio, the same uh, result as in the previous uh, generation. And so by going many, many times through this iterative cycle, we end up then with the optimized electric field, with the optimized laser field. Well, let's have a look on this particular this shows in laser technology the automated pulse compression. We come in with a disturbed laser pulse. This is, for instance, for the experts, the frog picture of that one. This intensity distribution, and this is a phase of that particular ultra-short laser pulse. 
which is broadened, for instance, by a regenerative amplifier. It goes into that uh, uh, zero dispersion compressor, and we get by second time generation information out as an optimization. We go through a learning algorithm as the numbers evolution, the fitness is increased. That means SRG, uh, second time generation yield is increased. And finally, we end up with the bandwidth limit laser pulse. This is a frog picture of that bandwidth limit laser pulse again. The green one is the final part, uh, and you see the flat phase. So this is a big step in laser technology. You no longer need to tweak mirrors or gratings or whatever. You can tell your computer what sort of laser pulses you need. You can do it for oscillator laser pulses, for amplified laser pulses, and even you can use it also to produce a polarization-shaped laser pulses. So <clears throat> I don't want to go into all these details, but just let me show you one example of a uh, a laser pulse where we produce and change not only the phase and the amplitude, but within a single femtosecond laser pulse, this is the envelope of that laser pulse. These are two different projections <coughs> perpendicular to each other. You see that from linear polarization, you can go to circular polarization, elliptic polarization, linear polarization again, etc. The color shows a momentary oscillatory frequency through the laser pulse, with this polarization shape, laser pulses now, where we have independent polarization for each of these spectral components, we have now access to the 3D uh, configuration of a molecular system. We can now pull in a certain direction of a bond or perpendicular to that, and that gives us access, of course, to uh, problems in chemistry like uh, enantiomer selectivity and other uh, problems which have, could not have been uh, uh, Tracked it and uh, attacked before. Now let's go to chemistry because that's what I said I want to show you. Let's assume if a complex system, if you want to break it here, you need a field like that. If you just want to break one ligand, you need a different field. This is again the pulse shaper we use, and we now look for the different electric fields which we need to really perform uh, these uh, chemical reaction dynamics. And of course, in a gas phase, I showed that we now use a molecular beam, a gas phase beam, and mass spectrometry to get the information back from uh, the system. <laughs> the first uh, simple molecular system we studied was the iron pentacarbonyl. Just to show you in which range it is possible, the, uh, the optimization show, showed us a bandwidth limit laser pulse, which gave us a ratio of 5 to 1. When we ask for the optimizing ratio of the parent ion versus the iron uh, ion, <coughs> where all the five C uh, CO ligands were taken off, this was uh, with the bandwidth laser pulse, we got the ratio of 5 to 1. If we asked and said, well, we want to get the inverse ratio, we want to maximize the, the iron yield versus the parent yield, we could vary that by more than a factor of 70 now to ratio 1 to 15 by a broad laser pulse, which was easily to understand. The reason I'm showing that is the following here. Of course, we have applied mm -hmm. the, uh, the objective of optimizing the, oh yeah, of optimizing the ratio. But of course, you could tune not only the ratio, you could also tune the total yields if we then include within the optimization uh, question. Here you see how the ratio changes the absolute uh, uh, yield and how the absolute changes when you change uh, to, to the ratio and to the total yields. So you have really access to different questions, to different problems you can study <coughs> within such a system. Let me come now to a more complex system <coughs> in organometallic <coughs> uh, chemistry. Here you have an iron ring bond, iron CL, uh, and two iron CO bonds. The, in the exciting state, the iron CL bond is the weakest bond. So the question was, when you use these optimization schemes, you want to get a particular system like that, or you want to keep uh, the FECL. Despite it's the weakest bond, you have the rip off the strongest bond, the two CO bonds. If it is possible to go from this versus that one in a maximization into the minimization where you have more uh, of the FECL surviving than <coughs> the, the larger molecular system. Of course, you can do that, and this was really a breakthrough in this area. You will find that you can use, by different electric fields, optimized electric fields, which contain all some information. You can change the ratio from 5 to 1 to 1 to 1. So you have found a way, a complex electric field, just changing the phases 
Not the number of photons, not the change in intensity, not change in the amplitude, just the phases of the different laser pulses that now you go from a ratio of 5 to 1 to 1 to 1. So you really you can select a certain <coughs> system, you can select a certain bond, and you can direct your system in that particular area, in that particular direction. We have done a lot of experiments on different other systems, but due to time constraints, I don't want to go into all the details. Just let me mention one thing <coughs> at the beginning. We do not need any information about the molecular system or about the chemical reaction itself in order to optimize a particular bond-breaking selectivity or a particular reaction channel. We have an automated quantum control of photodissociation reactions available now th uh, through this <coughs> pulse shaping techniques. But now let me come to the liquid phase because if this might be of interest for chemistry, it must be viable in solutions. Here, of course, the question is, can you, with an elect optimized electric field, go in this direction or that direction? Do you have some chemical selectivity? Of course, there are synthetic motivations and physical motivations. I don't want to go through all that. What we <coughs> used for that, for the first study, was a ruthenium metal in charge complex, <coughs> which had an absorption spectrum <coughs> here and an emission spectrum there. And the idea was, <coughs> based on the work of other people, that you use a nonlinear to photon transition <coughs> They excite uh, this metal in charge transfer band and looking at the emission and optimizing this emission, then you get the information about these pro uh, uh, property about <coughs> the optimization in a liquid phase. And of course, in the experiment, what you can do is <coughs> you <coughs> produce your optimized laser pulse. You can uh, look uh, via uh, second power generation on these nonlinear two photoposes, and here you have your molecule in methanol soft dissolved in methanol. In methanol, you look at the emission properties of that particular chromophore system. You could either maximize emission or maximize second time generation, but you could also maximize the ratios, as we'll show you in a minute, is essentially to get some information out, because in both cases, <coughs> uh, Emission and second time generation are two nonlinear processes requiring two photons. Here you see the number of generation, the emission yield, finally, and you see in the same plot when you maximize of second time generation. It looks obviously that there is no selectivity possible because both are two photon processes, and you see exactly the same optimization curve, but that only means you didn't ask the right question. What you need to know and what you can ask is, of course, you can ask, uh, what about optimization of the ratio of emission versus second time generation? Because this ratio removes the dominant intensity patterns and gives you then a sensitivity to the molecular problems. You see the ratio, you see as a function of the number of generations, you can maximize or minimize the ratio. And this is an unshaped laser part. That means there is selectivity in the liquid phase possible. And if you look, at, for instance, the optimized laser pulse in the Husimi distribution of that laser pulse, that means the frequency versus time, which is shown over here. This is the frequency of the laser pulse, this is the time. And here you see a time t equals zero. You see that here the intensity is concentrated. This is almost perfectly a bandwidth limited laser pulse, which gives you the answer for the minimization. Minimization of emission versus second time generation means we predominantly produce second time generation. Of course, the bandwidth limit laser pulse gives the highest yield, highest possible yield of second time generation. So this is not surprising. However, if you look at the maximization of emission versus second time generation, you get the clear information about what really is going on in liquid phase in this optimization. You find that at different times, here at minus one picosecond, you have a certain frequency which plays an important role here. After one and a half picosecond, this frequency plays a important role. At different times, different frequencies play an important role. That means now we have access to the molecular, internal molecular dynamics of such a system through these optimization algorithms, through these optimization questions which you can follow and ask. Of course, uh, one other thing, this was just one particular complex molecule in a solution. You could ask yourself, is it also possible if you have a sort of bimolecular reaction that you have different molecular systems of almost identical absorption profile uh, dissolved in the liquid phase, is there selectivity possible either exciting A or exciting B? 
Well, I don't have time to go through all the details. I just can tell you it is possible. You can really find the optimized electric field by which you can show that you can either optimize it as that A star uh, is A is excited or that B is excited. And here you see there's been uh, published last fall, last November in na Nature, that despite the fact that through these single parameter controls doesn't give you any possibility of selective excitation, the many parameter adaptive control is able to preferentially excite one of these particular molecular systems in the liquid phase versus the other one. That means in, now you can do chemistry, synthetic chemistry in a liquid phase by employing all these different techniques. Let me summarize the liquid phase control. Here we have looked through a couple of things. We can char optimize charge transfer. We can simultaneously control two different molecular systems. And we have selective excitation control in the liquid phase because the coherence is preserved on a rather long time scale up to a couple of picoseconds, even in a liquid phase, which gives us the possibility to find out by coherent control measures, by optimal control, the optimized electric fields by which we then can uh, get the optimized answer out of a system. So what I've shown you are a couple of things. I've shown you that automated pulse shaping with the experimental feedback in this sort can be used to produce any arbitrary uh, electric field which is needed to control processes in the gas in the liquid phase in the solid state phase. One particular example was photodissociation control in the gas phase of that complex organometallic molecule. And the photochemical photochemi selectivity in the liquid phase was shown on this <coughs> uh, DCM and ruthenium uh, charge transfer chromophore. And as a new tool, we have now available femtosecond polarization pulse shaping by which we can access not only the scalar properties of the electric field, also